Colin Chapman is a professor of anthropology at McGill University and a faculty member in the McGill School of Environment. He's the Canada Research Chair in Primate Ecology and Conservation. Much of his research involves fieldwork in Kabali National Park, Uganda. Since establishing the research program there, he has also set up a health clinic to meet the needs of the local community. Colin Chapman is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a Killam Fellow. I work with primates, so primarily with monkeys, although I have done some work on chimpanzees. And I'm in the Department of Anthropology and McGill School for the Environment here at McGill University. I'm also adjunct in biology and at the Red Path. So I do kind of lots of different things related to primate ecology, behavior, and conservation. What my research started as is really looking at uh, trying to understand primate social organization. So looking at questions about why some monkeys are found all by themselves or in small groups, whereas other monkeys you can find groups of two, three hundred. Uh, so it's really amazing the variation and what's the ecological factors kind of behind that and then what are the kind of social ramifications of that. These being in a big group, what does that mean for the males? How much do they compete? Those sorts of questions. And then from there what it did is kind of naturally evolve to look at conservation because the different places we were studying in the tropics we saw the forest disappear rapidly uh, upon occasions basically people would come to us offering us you know a primate for supper um, those sorts of things and so we progressively moved towards kind of looking at conservation and there we looked at what determines the abundance of monkeys so we looked at the quality of food so a lot of the research we've done is on what makes a good food, and now we've shifted war towards looking at the diseases and what diseases do the monkeys carry, what are their consequences in terms of their fitness, their reproduction, those sorts of questions. Well, basically, we're working with colleagues, uh, primarily from the University of Wisconsin, and uh, I do more of the ecology work, and he does the viral work, and we've basically been working on a species called a red colobus monkey, which probably no one's ever heard of. It's a, an endangered species in East Africa. And we are studying kind of their disease ecology. And with that, we've basically done darting and looked at uh, what sort of viruses they have. And so they have new types of uh, viruses that are kind of new to mankind. And we're trying to figure out how they evolved, when they diverge from the kind of ancestral type and what the fitness consequences are, which is where I come in again. Some of these animals I've known now for, oh, about eight years, these particular animals. And, you know, they seem to be doing fine. They, you know, they have these, what we would think are serious diseases, but they are doing fine. They're not showing no signs of being sick. It might affect them over the long term, but, you know, it's, they're getting by quite well. But, you know, we need to be able to figure out uh, the history of the viruses. So where did they come from originally? And then, uh, if we can figure out some of that, we can also figure out why are the monkeys not dying? So the monkeys with these new uh, viruses that are new to mankind, they're not apparently at least seriously affecting their fitness. So how do they uh, cope with these new things? What we found is basically uh, new types of viruses that are like um, human AIDS basically came from a virus that came from, well, one of them came from chimpanzees and one of them came from a type of monkey, a sooty mangabe. And we found yet another type, which is in the red colobus. And so we can look at kind of how these viruses have been diverged and how the monkeys are, are dealing with them. What we're really interested a lot is how disease might jump from primates to humans. And we're most interested in kind of the primates to humans, monkeys to humans, because we're closely related to them. So we can really study what are the ecological settings that would cause diseases to jump. So I like, don't like to work with the viruses because we don't know if they can jump, but I've been working with some of the, uh, the worms that are found in people's stomachs or monkeys' stomachs and looking at if those can jump and what sort of conditions could cause that. We've recently potentially found uh, kind of a, a type of virus that is uh, Ebola-like. And it's unlikely that it will cause um, the same sort of uh, outbreaks of kind of death and those sorts of things, but it has the same molecular structure. So we can start to study what uh, that would involve. Uh, 
I always like kind of the simplest answer. And the simplest answer is because, you know, they're really interesting and they deserve a place in this world too. And if you actually watch them, you'd think that they were valuable. And so that's the simplest answer. If you want something, if I was talking to my dad who thinks about business all the time and kind of human health, I'd go for a human health answer. Uh, monkeys are very good at kind of being models for diseases. A lot of our diseases came from monkeys. We can figure out how we got those diseases. We can figure out how they handle those diseases. And so that might help us deal with some of the, the human diseases that we have. Or we could prevent new diseases from you know, coming into uh, existence. So yeah, we've talked about, you know, in the literature, things like SARS, um, <clears throat> um, bird flu, uh, swine uh, flu. You know, basically, all those are things that are coming from animals and sometimes from primates and we can figure out how potentially to stop those transmissions occurring. Um, <clears throat> to me, kind of most gratifying is kind of solving puzzles. It's more like a little mystery. And so, you know, I often, some of the puzzles are very small. I really want to know why individual X, you know, is always around the other, this other individual. And sometimes they're larger, you know, you know what, why are there monkeys, so many monkeys at this part of the forest and so few over there? But they're all just little puzzles and then you collect these little pieces of the puzzle and put them all together. And the other thing I really like doing is I like working with graduate students and uh, the students in general because often you can show them you know, brand new things. You know, things that you've seen hundreds and hundreds of times you know, that are just kind of you know, old hat, you're used to them, but for the student who sees it the first time you go, oh yeah, that is interesting. Well, where my research, I think, is going to go is going to go more towards conservation um, and kind of two different ways, I think. More towards understanding diseases and how diseases influence monkeys and also how those diseases can um, be sponsored by certain sorts of conditions in the environment or they can be transmitted between different species, what allows that. And the other thing we'll be working on a lot is uh, basically habitat restoration. So in the world today, and particularly in the tropics, we've, um, well, trashed a lot of it. And now there's times when we can put it back together again. So things with respect to particularly climate change. There's huge incentives basically to pay tropical countries to reforest areas and basically take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into huge tropical trees. And so we don't really know how to do that. So that will be something that you know, my group is going to work on. And then I'm really interested in what's the consequence of that. You know, which monkeys will come back? You know, which uh, other, other animals will come back? One thing we're finding right now is one of the animals that comes back are elephants, uh, which is really good. Elephants are coming back in some of the areas we're working in. But it's also really uh, a challenge because you have an elephant population, a growing elephant population, in a national park where there's 200 or 300 people per square kilometer outside of the park. So we have to start figuring out how to deal with those sorts of consequences. We've been working in a place called Kibale National Park for the last 20 years, my wife and I and all the grad students. And the local community has really been uh, tremendous. They've really you know, welcomed us into their community. They've allowed us to um, work in their area, work in their land. Um, and we've always been, you know, doing things that are kind of, in my mind, a bit uh, somewhat arrogant. We drive up to schools in our, you know, four-wheel drive vehicle and give lectures to the school children about the value of conservation, you know, why you should conserve the forest. And, you know, the children look at it really well and they're very receptive, but then I'm turning around and thinking, well, you know, our truck is worth, you know, way more than their father's going to make in their lifetime. And so what we did a few years ago is we set up um, what's called the uh, Kibale Health and Conservation Project. And what we wanted to do is give something back to the community. And we asked the community, well, what would you like? And they all said jobs. And we immediately realized, well, we don't have enough money to give very many people jobs. The next thing we wanted really was kind of something like health insurance because, well, they get the paycheck at the end of the month and a week or two through the month their money's gone. And so if they get sick, what do they do? Uh, they have to find somebody who will lend them money 
or they just don't go to the doctor, which is often the case. So we basically built a health center, and a lot of this was with funds raised by McGill students. Uh, so we built a health center, and the health center uh, runs at a kind of replacement cost. So we pay the, uh, the fees for the doctor to visit and the nurses to be there permanently through money that's fundraised through McGill. And then um, people can come there if they are just coming for a checkup, it costs them nothing. If they're coming because they have malaria, which is very often a, a topical thing they get, um, then they're given the proper, appropriate drugs to basically treat the malaria and they have to pay back that amount of money. But they don't have to pay it back now. They can pay it back in a week's time when the next paycheck comes in. And that's worked yeah, really well. We've only had one person out of thousands who hasn't paid us back. It serves about 6,000 people. So because it's kind of unique in the area and it is less expensive than other things, lots of people are coming from quite a ways away to uh, have these sorts of services. But that's something that we really wanted to have happen because hopefully what they do is they literally have to go through the park gate entrance and the clinic is about 100 meters into the park. So it's just along a road that's kind of along the side of the park. So they really have to come into the park and realize they're getting basically this good health care from something that's associated with the park. If the park wasn't there, McGill students would have raised this money. So the park, while it might say, you know, you can't go in and take firewood or you can't go hunt monkeys or bushmeat, it's they're going to be saying, well, we can't do that, but they have given us something, something in return. And hopefully they think that is worthwhile. And we're actually studying whether or not their views have changed over time. The students have been great because they've done a lot of the fundraising. Um, they've been, you know, all sorts of, uh, you know, interesting events like uh, students shaving their heads. You know, that made, you know, almost a thousand dollars. And some of the students have gone over to Africa and they've seen the health center and then they're basically the dollar they raise, they know it's going to, you know, nurse Lucy's, you know, salary. And other people kind of, the engineers, uh, basically they put forward a money to make a water system. So they did things that are very concrete. The trick is really to stay at it. And if you're going to stay at it, the only way to do that is to have fun. So the best thing to do is basically choose a line of research that seems fun, entertaining, uh, enjoyable, and then you'll stick at it and then you'll find something new along the way. Mm -hmm. Like there's one that's open. Really with the field work you have to be very, very flexible because yeah, even after all these years of kind of working in the field, I go there with a project in mind and you know, I realize I can't do half of what I thought I could do and you know, the elephants are in that area this month and I'm not gonna go there. Um, so you have to be really flexible and kind of be able to respond to what conditions allow you to do. But then you have to think about, you know, okay, they've, they have changed. How do, I, how do I respond to that and still get good science done?